All right, we're with uh, Stephen Key. Thanks, Stephen, for joining us. Stephen is a, a well-known author of uh, One Simple Idea, and uh, some. you have a couple of books in that series, right? Well, if, yes, I have two. There's a yellow book. That's for licensing, simple ideas. Right. And maybe not so simple ideas. And then there's a red one up there, and that one's for venturing your ideas. Got it, right. Okay, now I've, I've recommended your book, uh, the yellow book, for people who want to license. And a lot of my clients are, uh, they're independent inventors, small business people, typically micro entity and small entity. And sometimes coming to this for the first time and they just don't know what to do. Okay. I've often recommended that they read your book first so that they can get an idea of, you know, whether or not licensing uh, is the best route for them or if they think that they have everything that they need to do a venture. And, you know, so what is it that you tell people who say, hey, I got this idea, I'm going to make a million dollars, but I've never done this before. What kind of what's the practical advice that you give? Them? Oh, boy, that's a that's a big question. But thank you. Number one, thank you for telling them to, to read one simple idea, because, Kevin, I agree. Uh, you need a roadmap. Right. And right. there's not a lot of roadmaps out there that the traditional way that's been taught in universities forever. And everybody's even talking about it now is uh, the old way is I'm going to file for patents at the very beginning. I'm going to build prototypes and then I'll start a company. And then maybe after a couple of years, I'll show my idea to, to, to the world and see what happens. Right. Don't forget business plan. They're going to write a business plan. Business plan. <laughs> but you know, you know what's crazy about it? I don't think, I think there's a lot of people out there that, that um, they have great ideas. Right, but they don't want to quit their job. They don't want to write that business plan. They do not want to raise capital. Um, they don't want to do all those things, but they have great ideas. What do they do? So I, I think the option now is um, because, of, because of open innovation, there's all these companies that need your ideas. Right. That the opportunity is huge now for people to license or rent their ideas to companies and collect royalties for every one those companies sell. And the one reason why I like it so much today, I think the best protection, I think you're gonna agree with this, um, you need a lot of intellectual property from a trademark, maybe a copyright, provisional patent application. But when you license- URL, like the you, dot .com domain name, right? Critical. But yep. one of the best protections when you license an idea uh, mm -hmm. is that company that has the shelf space. Right, they're, they're already ready. It, it's not gonna take you five years and you're not gonna start with inventory in your garage and put it up on Amazon. You find that company that's already got the shelf space and they can take it and bring it to market very quickly. But what's really important, and I think that's hopefully this one thing we're gonna talk about, in order to get that licensing agreement, you need a well-written provisional patent application. It's your first thing. Right. A lot of people will come to me and they'll say, well, I want to get on Shark Tank. Well, first of all, the first question they're going to ask is, what are your sales? And second, what's your patent position, right? So obviously both of those are important. Patents are something that they can do pretty quickly. And you're right, with a provisional, uh, they can lock that in. And they're not, even, uh, they're not even locked into what's written in the provisional because a year later you're going to file the non-provisional. See, this, the great thing about a provisional patent application, it gives you that one year patent pending, right? It gives you that security and you can shop your idea around to see if there's interest. Right. It, it's, it's, I think it's the best tool, but I think because of the new laws, you need to file often and you need to file fast, but you need to file it the correct way. All right. And that means you need to do some homework, prior art searching, all the things that you do that you guys do a great job at because it's your foundation. And, and when you license your idea to a company, they're going to ask to see that provisional patent application. Right. And it's really yeah. a selling tool. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing that I always recommend. I mean, people say, can I file my own provisional? And I say, absolutely do it today. In fact, sometimes people will, will send me a document that is essentially that it's a provisional application. And I'll ask them, did you file that? You know, no, that's just my disclosure document. What are you waiting for? File it. It's $70 at the patent office. You get your filing date. 
And the worst case scenario is if it's not adequate in some way, then I can look at it and we can try to fix that over the next few weeks, but at least you'll get a filing date today and get first in line at the patent office. Yeah, I, I love that um, strategy because I do think you have to file it fairly quick and you're not going to get it correct. You're not going to get it perfect. I tell everybody, if, you, if you've done it yourself, fantastic. Right. But the minute a company wants to see that application, have them sign a non-disclosure, be professional before you disclose anything confidential, have a patent attorney or patent agent review it. Yeah. Because it's really a selling tool in my mind, right? right. And, and if it's done correctly, you can even sell the benefit of your idea in the title because those titles are gonna change, right? Right. You can sell, you can use that as a selling tool through the whole, whole process. So if that company does see it, and they ask you if you have intellectual property, and you, you, you tell them you have a, you know, a PPA, and they say, let's see it, they sign an NDA, you want to make sure those drawings look great, you know. Right. You're, you're trying to impress them. You don't want to have anything that's going to cause a red flag. Um, but by all means, if you have something yourself, file it, file it today, and you at least get in line. Worst case scenario is it doesn't help you until you file a professionally written application. But at least you have something. No, and, you, and I like what you say is the, is the perception of ownership. So explain that a little bit, how that, how that works. Yeah, this is something a lot of people struggle with. Um, I see licensing agreements signed through my company, InventRight, just about every week now. And all those agreements, there's no patents yet. Right. It could be. Mm -hmm. Right. But there is a, a, a well-written provisional patent application that has value now, right? And so, because I don't think you ever really own anything, to tell you the truth. That, and that sounds terrible, right? Um, but I think today, because there's, there could be workarounds, um, I don't think companies typically just steal idea. They might work around your right. idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because of the internet, Amazon, Alibaba, it's really hard to, to keep everybody out, but, but, but you can keep people out with some simple tools. If you write your provisional patent application that has workarounds, right? I tell everybody, steal it from yourself. Right. So that's great value. Um, if you can file a trademark, please be, go ahead. Maybe a copyright. Those are all good. URL, you said that too. It starts to build this perceived ownership. Right. Because... I don't think you have to really own it completely. And I don't think anybody does because it's really about customer service first to market, right? Marketing savvy, all that. All that stuff. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is if you have an IP portfolio that you're bringing to the table as well as know-how and some other things, then your patent, your license doesn't have to be Patrick centric. You know, it doesn't live and die by whether or not the patent gets approved or not. And only about half of the utility patents get approved. Yeah. Nationwide, so you know. That's I love it. No, and you're giving some real truth here, which I really like. A lot of people don't want to don't want to share what we're sharing t today, uh, but, but it's reality. You're right. Um, most in most situations, a lot of those patents are worthless, right? Okay, but you still need to file, right, and and have that opportunity to expand upon it because you don't know what direction it's going to go to. Right. But I also believe. If you, if you look at it as a selling tool, a licensing tool, if you look at the workarounds, you know, steal it from yourself, uh, maybe even file a design patent. I love design patents, and people don't talk enough about those. And I think they're so important today, uh, especially if you're going to do a crowdfunding thing. Yeah. The two, two ways to stop someone that's going to copycat you, and they trust me, if you're successful, they will. Right. And there's a mechanism to stop them out there. So it's almost like whack-a-mole, but you can do it. You need the, the trademark and you need a design patent because the copycats don't vary very much from that. Because Yeah, well, and, and design patents have gotten stronger over the last few years with the, the change to the ordinary observer test in court. So now if your competitor has a product that just kind of looks similar to yours, you know, and, and, the, and the public is confused, you might have a good case there. And for a thousand bucks or $1,500, it's almost like a no brainer compared to 
a utility pen. Uh, I, I say if you can file both, do. They're not mutually exclusive. And then you can say multiple patents pending. It's a little bit bigger of a no trespassing sign, right? It is. And, uh, and you're probably going to get the, the design patent. 95% of the time they go through. So I, I like design patents too. I think there's a lot of bang for the buck there. And, and there's not a lot of people who consider them, considering that there's only 40,000 of those issued every year compared to half a million utility patents. Yeah, I'm really surprised. Um, number one, I think you're right. It's, it's very affordable. It, it's one more. I've, I've got a, a patent pending or eventually a patent. It's one more. And number two, it, it has a, it gives you that broader perceived ownership. I think mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And plus, because of everybody selling online now, the copycats, it's a great tool to stop them because they, they, right. don't, they don't redesign. They just copy what you've done and yep. they sell it. And not only that, it's going to be the first arrow that you have in your quiver because it usually issues in about a year as opposed to, you know, two to three years with a utility pad. No, I think everybody that's going to play on the crowdfunding, you know, that's growing by leaps and bounds. You have to file a trademark and a design patent. That to me, and realize it's going to take, well, you're right, a year, maybe a little bit longer. So don't just build your campaign, get it out there, and then think about filing. <laughs> right. Well, another thing happens, you know, a, a file, if you post your project, you go live with your Kickstarter campaign, that's a public disclosure, and now you've eliminated the ability to file patents in most foreign countries. Yes. If you're not yet patent pending. Okay. And you've started that one-year timer in the United States. And more importantly, you've probably tipped off your competitors, hey, here's an idea, and we haven't filed a patent yet. So... Someone told me, and this is not my quote, but I absolutely love it. They were saying that crowdfunding sites are just a catalog for China. <laughs> That's so, great. I, you know, I think you just have to be practical, yeah. right? And, and realize, I don't, think you own, I don't think you're gonna stop everybody, but you can stop a lot of people, okay? Um, I tell everybody, it's like, when you get that patent, it's like a big, big cherry pie. You think you're gonna eat all the cherry pie. And it's warm. But in today's world, you might get 90% of that cherry pie. Okay. And you might have to share it with some of those guys out there that might do something a little funny. That's okay. If if someone is going to, going to copy you, you're successful. Congratulations. Right. Yeah. Hopefully you're the first to the market and you get the, the biggest market share. I think one of the best protections too is, is tell your story on social media. And and be that original. Yeah, I don't think retailers really would like to be the guy that's carrying the, the, the copycat, right? Right. That's interesting. That's interesting. I like that. Okay, now let's shift over to licensing a little bit because okay. a lot of my clients, when, they, when they're really honest with themselves and they step back and they say, Am I, do I really have the experience and the knowledge necessary to do marketing and accounting and, and all of the things that are required to run a business? Very often they'll say, no, uh, it, let me just look at licensing. So what's, uh, obviously filing a provisional patent or some kind of a patent is, is important, but how do, you, uh, how do you start to identify or look for the companies that are really the right ones? Because I've made that mistake. I've got this idea and the only company that wants, that would, that would make sense for is Starbucks. And they're, they're a nightmare to try to get through. I mean, you know, they're so big that, that I'm just a little gnat. And so I know you like the smaller to mid-sized companies, but how do you find those guys? Well, I think it's really easy. Uh, in fact, it's so easy, it it's surprises me how easy this is. If you have an idea, and if you think it's going to sell inside of a Walmart, just go down to Walmart and find that shelf space. Okay. All right, and go, oh, my product's going to sell there. All those other companies you're going to reach out to. You know they're big or Okay, on a good enough. size, yeah, big yeah. enough. They're in Walmart, great distribution, right. so you know that, right? Um, if you want to be in Walgreens or CVS or wherever, just go down to that retail environment and really see where you're going to be. That's the best thing to do that. And I think you're right. Make your, make your list of companies, and you're going to have your favorites. Maybe it's Starbucks. Maybe it's McDonald's. Okay. That's hard, all right? Yeah. It's not impossible, 
But what we've seen, um, and the reason why we think a lot of our students are so successful, we require them to call 30 companies. And we know their first 10 are those big favorite companies. <laughs> so right. we got to get past that. Got to get, gotta get those through, right? Yeah, you do. But they're still want, they still want to reach out to them. We don't want to say, no, don't. Reach, go ahead, reach out to them. But it's the company number 21, number 27, number 28. Those are the deals. It's those smaller, mid-sized guys that really need an idea. They right. need us, but not the big guys, no. Yeah. Now, you said you're students. So tell me about uh, InventRight, what you do, and how that relates to the book. Okay. Um, I've been licensing my own ideas for a long time, probably 30-plus years, and I found a very simple technique because um, I, I realized that if I – I really realized that my wife was going to stay married to me. I better figure this out because I really wanted to do this. I wanted to be creative. I did not, I did want to start a, a business, but I had, I have a lot of ideas. So I thought if I showed a company an idea, the benefit of an idea without building the prototype, even just a benefit. And if they said, yes, I could then build a prototype. So I was always testing with a very simple sell sheet. So when someone said, Steve, what do you do? I tell everybody, I educate now on how to bring a product to market through licensing by selling the benefit first. That allows you not to get bogged down in filing patents, but a, a PPA, provisional patent application, that allows you to, to build a 3D computer generated sample that, that doesn't even exist for $100 on the internet that allows you to reach out to a friendly, inventor-friendly company and say, hey, what do you think of, here's this pretty picture of my idea, what do you think? Right. So it, now it's become an idea, idea generator situation. I'm just gonna come up with a lot of ideas and I'm gonna send them out. That's different than I'm gonna build one idea, spend a year on it, everything else. So- Invest a 10, $20,000 into it, yeah. Yeah, so that's why we see a lot of success because now it, it, we flipped it. We're going to sell the benefit, not the product. Right. So in VintRight, um, I've been teaching for 20 years this process. It's a 10-step process. And then I gave it away in one simple idea. Uh, <laughs> McGraw-Hill asked me to write a book. And I said, why? And some really smart people said, if you're, really, if you're really good at something, give it all away. So I gave it all away. I put it in one simple idea, the 10 steps. Everybody thought I was crazy to do it. Um, but what happened People wanted more. Okay. Okay. So we, we have a YouTube channel, InventRight TV. We, we had over 600,000 people watching last year. And then I teach, a, uh, I have students because you can become a member of InventRight. But Kevin, it's the same stuff that's in the book. I tell everybody, it's in the book. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So what people don't understand, I love this business so much. It's been so good to me. I didn't go out to set a company to teach people. But that's what it's become a little bit now. So InventRight is this, um, it's a community of like-minded individuals. All our coaches were former students at, at, at licensed ideas. They, they're, they're, they want to give back. Everybody wants to give back. So what's happened is we have students in 60 different countries. Wow. Um, there's 20 of us at InventRight. Um, and we just educate. We have classes every week, but that's a membership. And those are really serious people that know they want coaching. Right. And, but I don't think you necessarily need it for everyone. I, I, I don't think that's, some people don't need to be coached. Right. But, but the smart people do this and you know, this, and the smart people know they need help. Okay. Why not? I mean, every, every situation in the world, you go, you go, you go to school to get educated. If you're going to be on a sports team, you have a coach. Right. Okay. So it's pretty common. Um, I think the smart people also realize I cannot do everything myself. Okay. So I need a professional person to maybe do my, my sell sheet. I might need a patent agent or a patent attorney to help me with my, my PPA or my trademark. Those are, that's, you're getting smart now because those aren't really expensive tools, but they're smart tools. Here's the catch. You have to guide whoever you work with. 
And you know that some people probably come to you with an idea and go, here, patent this idea. <laughs> okay, that's that smart, right? right. It's, it's smarter to go, here's, here's maybe a prototype I built, here's my one line benefit statement, here's my sell sheet, these are companies I wanna go after, right? This was work, I did some prior art, this what doesn't work, but they give you all this information for you to do the right job. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate too, that if you do work with anybody in the legal profession, give them the right tools. Just don't go here because I think there's a lot of bad patents because of that, Kevin. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. You know, it, what you get out is directly related to what you've put into it, right? So, uh, and there's times where it's pulling teeth from clients trying to get the information to write a good patent. It's just very, just very interesting sometimes that, uh, you know, you see all different types. Yeah, I just think that they need to take more ownership of it a little bit, take a little bit more time, and, and really become the expert. If you want to write your own provisional patent application, good for you. Um, I, would, I recommend that people write your own and then give it to your, uh, your patent attorney or patent agent and have them uh, now write it, polish it up, take a look at it, see what you missed. That's uh, right. But I, I wish more people would take more responsibility, but no, they, you know what happens? They get so excited. Right? Well, and uh, plus they're looking for, they're looking for a one stop shop, like these invention scam companies that'll say they can, they can market to every industry. They can handle the patents. They can do everything for you. All you have to do is wait. Well, first of all, you have to pay us about 10 grand and then wait for a long time. And uh, then the money will start coming in. And I'll tell you what, I tell people, you got You really got to do your homework when you're looking at these companies that claim to be able to market to everybody. There, there's no such thing. No, there isn't. People ask that all the time. They, they want this magical person to come along, and I'm not that person. I tell that person yeah. does not exist. Um, you're the only one that can make this happen. Exactly so right. If you do want to work with anybody, and I think you agree with this too, you know, type in their name, you know, look, do some homework on the internet, see what people are saying, look at the reviews, ask for a referral. I mean, it's amazing. People go out to dinner and they, they, they look at the menu more than <laughs> they do picking out who they're going to spend $10,000 with. It's like, it's really true and really scary. It, uh, it is because you hear these stories and you just want to go, didn't you, didn't you Google their name? I mean, right. Didn't you see all the uh, FTC complaints that were filed on the government website? <laughs> yeah, that's hopefully um, because of the internet and because of people like us putting out information, right? And people are finding it and they're listening to it and they right. start to educate themselves that we won't have um, people frustrated, um, maybe spending money they don't have. Or, or maybe spending money in the wrong place, let's put it that way, better yet. And I think you have to control your own destiny. No one's gonna help you. Well, and not only that, you're gonna be the one who's the most excited about your project. Uh, I mean, now, do you, what, what do you think about licensing agents? What do I you think know? they're like a unicorn. I think they're a unicorn or a four-leaf clover or they're, um, <laughs> A leprechaun. I think they're leprechauns. Yes. I, I think you hear about them. I just don't know of any. I, I get this question all the time. Yeah, I only need a licensing agent. I go, do you know of any? I go, no. Because what do you mean? You've been doing this for how many years? I don't know. I don't know one. I, I think you're right. I, you want that person, right? But no one's going to work that hard for you. Right. If you're a licensing agent, you've got 20 ideas that you're trying to pitch you know, the chance of yours being the big one is, is pretty low. I, you need to go after your own destiny, like you said. I, I think also you need to build your own relationship with these companies. Yeah. And if they reject, you know, if they don't like your idea, ask why. You might be able to come back. That's when a lot of creativity really happens. Mm. You submit it to them. It's not quite, you ask why, you go back, you redesign, maybe submit it again. Or better yet, since you build that relationship, even they said, even though they said no, you come back with another idea. Right. That's why you always end it with, I, I appreciate you taking the time to look at this idea. I understand you didn't, uh, didn't want to pursue it, but can I approach you in the future when I come up with new ideas? 
see, I believe that's when you truly become a pro. Right. Is when you get rejected, you come back with another idea. Yeah. It's a numbers game. And that's why if you're an idea person, come up with a lot of ideas. Um, at InventRight, if someone comes to us with just one idea, they're not a good fit. Right. No, they're just not. Or if they want us to do the work, we're not the right fit. Right. Okay. Or yeah, You call all the companies. <laughs> well, we have to because I know it's not that hard to do it. It sounds hard. But it sounds, it's really great when you do. When you get into that one company, you talk to someone, yes, we'll look at your idea. You're in. That's your connection. You did it. Right. You own it. So if, yep. if I had someone doing that for me, I'd be asking a million questions. Who did you talk to? What did you say? Right. You're one step removed. If that guy doesn't know you, all sorts of problems. It doesn't work. So that's why I don't think this whole licensing, someone in between that's going to help you, I don't think it works. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, now, uh, in terms of, um, of finding the right guy at the company, I mean, how a lot of people are just stuck right at, like, they know that they want to approach this company. But now what? There's, you know, there's not a big link to the guy's email or phone number that says, you know, submit your product to me. Sometimes there is, but usually. There is. Some, no, sometimes there is, actually. And, and yeah. it's, it's becoming more and more popular. But I look at it this way. It's really, it's really quite simple again. Um, first of all, go on LinkedIn. All right. Right. Very simple. You can find anybody in LinkedIn. Right. And. And if you want to start with someone in sales, those guys are pretty good getting back to people, right? They, they just have a habit of following up, getting back. I mean, they're in sales, so they'll talk to you. In fact, if you want to call a company, forget LinkedIn for a moment. Call the company up, ask for someone in sales. Guess what? They're going to pick up the phone and talk your ear off. All right. <laughs> yeah, and you're not going to get a, v a voicemail. No, those guys, they, they get paid to talk. Right. So, and they're, they want to sell like they want to sell products too, right? So you can ask them, look, I'm a product developer, I'd like to submit an idea to your company. Do you take outside submissions? And if it's not you, who else? Who who is it? And they'll redirect you. Same thing on LinkedIn. Find someone in sales or find someone in marketing. Right? That's even a better person, but they're very, very busy. And just say, look, you want to submit an idea to the company, who's the correct person? Don't pitch. Don't right. pitch. Don't put a link to go here. Don't make it a long email. No, no, no. Short. The shorter, the better. One, uh, yeah, one question. <laughs> yes, that's it. Because what happens um, when you, you write these long emails, you get them, right? And you're at, first of all, we haven't even met. There's no introduction. And now you're asking all this of my time. That's not right. That's not right. Okay. But they are obligated when you ask them who's the right person within the company to redirect you. It seems like there's more of an obligation there, and they'll do that very simply. So um, it's usually someone in mark. The ideal best person is a, the project manager in marketing. They're, they control the beginning and the end of a project. That's the best. Right. Hardest person to get to, too. Never the president. Stop going to the president. In fact, even if he got it, he's going to send it down to someone that actually do the work. Right. All right. So that doesn't work. Vice president. If it's a small enough company, yeah, go ahead. All right. But find that person. If it's a really, really monster, right? Coca-Cola, Pepsi, P&G, Starbucks, McDonald's. The department you want to go after is new product development, right? Because they're not going to show marketing or sales anything unless they've looked at it and vetted it and make sure it could work. Right. Yeah. And and that's really the best place. And if you really want to go after a really big guy like Starbucks, I love that you brought that up. You can't knock on the front door. I've tried that. <laughs> but there's another door you can go in. Yeah. You can go in through, um, it's funny, PR people always answer emails at every oh, company. Okay. Yeah. And um, go through their ad agency. Okay. Their ad agency is, is almost obligated an idea they think has some merit to show it to the client. Right. And, but you have to be a little careful about that. If you, if you find, and you find everybody's ad agency, but the ad agency for Starbucks, is going to come right up. They, they brag about it. But if you call them up, ask for someone in um, new business, 
and say, I've got this great product for someone at Starbucks, but what are your clients? They'll take a look at it and they'll go, Ooh, this maybe is good for Starbucks. Let them figure that out and do that. Right. Yeah. So there's a way to get in, but you're right. Still to get them to say yes, is difficult. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Good. Well, let's see. Um, one of the, uh, one of the things I get a lot, I'm just, I assume that you do too, but I just want to get your take on it, is if someone says, I got this great idea, I don't want to license it, I want to make it, I just want to sell it to somebody for a million bucks. And, and what's your, what's your uh, response on that? I've never seen that happen yet. And I've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, and the reason why, why, why would they buy it from you? They don't even know if it's, I don't know what it's worth yet. Right. I yeah. would rather license it, pay as you go, and then there might be a time where I might buy it out then. Right. And that happens, but never at the very beginning. I always use the, the restaurant building analogy. You know, if you own a restaurant building, you have a choice. You can run the restaurant yourself, hire the cooks and deal with the county inspectors and order the food and all that yourself. That's a full-time job. But if it's successful, you'll get the lion's share of the profit. The other option, if you own that building, is you can lease it to Denny's. They already know how to run a restaurant. Uh, you'll get a steady rent check. It won't be the lion's share of the profit, but you'll get a steady passive income. The problem is it's an empty building right now. A restaurant's never been run out of there. No one knows if that's a good location or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, seems to, you know, that know. seems to make some sense. They don't know. See, I, I think licensing, um, it takes away – a little bit of risk, right? And they still have to produce product and market and everything else. But at the end of the day, you pay as you go. If it works, I pay a little bit of royalty. This is the thing that kills me. People all the time are like, why would they pay you? You know, maybe for just a provisional patent application. Why would they pay you? I get that all the time. Uh, what's happening now, because most products have a very short lifespan, Okay. I mean, the typical lifespan, I hate to tell you how short it is. It's really short. Some ideas go longer, but typically they're very short. So when a company, when, when a company sees, your, sees your idea, they want to sell it. Their patent attorney in-house wants, wants, wants to own it. No one wants to fight in court. Okay. No one wants to go through that mess, right? So. But also, you have to realize, since that's a short lifespan, it's all about selling now. You have perceived ownership. You can go after somebody, but that's not the great way. It's like whack-a-mole. I just said, every, they could be everywhere. You're not going to stop everybody. So I think they're looking at it differently now, that it's more a sales environment. The best protection is first the market, as you said. Having some perceived ownership, you're going to keep a lot of people out that are the you know, honest people. Right. Well, I like your idea. Of if you're the original and you've got the story and, and the marketing people can wrap around that, what a, great, what a great thing to have. Yeah, so I don't think it's so much. I think it's changed a little bit. And I think those companies are practical to say, all right, hey, we can file a non-provisional if we want to. Okay. You can negotiate, let them file it. Okay. But you, you've, you've come to them with some perceived ownership that's packaged in such a way that they say, yes, you've taken away some risk. Here's the other catch people don't realize. When you're, you're talking about royalties for licensing agreements, I structure it a couple different ways. Um, if a patent gets issued, pay me a higher royalty rate. If it's patent pending, keep it at, let's say, 5%. Fair. Right. If it dev doesn't issue, pay me one. Here's the catch. In the licensing agreement, be able to add improvements. Oh, absolutely. And it's in the grant of license be able to add improvements yep. because what that means, I can file another provisional patent application. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. you own it. It gets folded into the. Yes. Patent. And now I've got patent pending again. Right. And I can keep doing that to probably the life of the product if I had to. Right. So I think you're right. I mean, if a company really wants to own the patent or the claims, you just open it up and realize it has a short lifespan, and you know, you know for a fact, you can get a claim on something, right? 
Oh, sure, if I had enough detail. <laughs> and, and, maybe, and maybe you write it that way that any IP, you get paid. Right, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a point at which a patent is just so worthless that it doesn't really you know, have, have the value that, that you would think it would have. I've seen design patents that are stronger than some utility patents. I believe that's true. I do believe, now, we're talking about ideas that go in and out pretty quick. So let's talk about some bigger ideas. Okay. Bigger ideas that are going to require more time, maybe, maybe new machinery. Mm -hmm. um, like your spin label, right? That's, that's a good example. You have a whole portfolio of patents on that. Yeah, 20 patents. On, on an, on a, that's the craziest thing you've ever heard. One idea, 20 patents, and it was patented 70 years ago. See, that's what people... That's the craziest story ever. I cannot own it because it was already invented. But how did I get 20 patents? Well, I, my patents are on the manufacturing of it. Right. No one knew how to manufacture. So it's really a game that's being played a little bit. Um, I, I think there's always shades of gray. It's not black or white. I think you just know what the rules are, educate yourself, and, but realize um, in today's environment, um, there's simple tools. That, that give you that perceived ownership. That's all you need. Right, right. Excellent. If you have a big idea, wait, one last. If you have a big idea, you're going to need, I think they call it the full deck. You're going to need a bunch of patents. You're going to need copyrights, trademarks, URL. You're going to need all this stuff. And even then, people are going to get around you if they really want to. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's like going to war. You position your troops as best you can. You, you figure out where your resources are best spent. Nothing's for sure what's going to happen, but go in with your best foot forward, your best possible case, and try to get some sales. I mean, nothing happens until someone sells something. So yeah, You know, um, I remember someone told me early on, Steve, it's not about protection. It's about selling. That's, a, uh, that's not easy. And also, I think you're right. Um, my attitude is that you include some workarounds. And so I'm, I'm getting ready for someone to steal it for me at the very beginning. I'm just going to, I'm just going to assume that someone's going to steal it from me. So I include some of the workaround language up front. I often say that, you know, you got to put your competitor's hat on and figure out how you're going to break this. Yes. How are you going to get around this pattern? But, because you know how fun it is for engineers. <laughs> To, to get a project. Steve, that's the purpose of the patents is to publish it so that engineers can come along and improve it. That's called progress. Yeah. That's why the government gives you, a citizen, the right to stop another citizen from making and using and selling something. So that's what it's all about. And <laughs> people don't get that. Just today I was talking with a client who said, well, I can renew my patent, right? No, you cannot. Because the government wants you to have a limited monopoly, limited in time, so that other inventors will have a shot at it later. Well, you know, it's really scary when you think of it that way, but, but I think you're, you're absolutely 100% right. Uh, I just think engineers love to reverse engineer stuff, and <laughs> they like to find a different way, better way, whatever. I think they've just been trained to do that, and reverse engineering is a pretty popular topic. I mean, it, there's even classes in how to do that, isn't there? I saw online people were teaching those methods. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's kind of the American spirit, right? I mean, you, you see something, there's a patent in your way. It's like, all right, how do I, how do I improve this? How do I get around it? I mean, that's, that's what made us a country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, when all I remember, I was in federal court, all right, so I've defended – my patents in federal court against the largest toy company in the world, Lego. And looking back with that great experience, I, I would not wish that to, to, to anybody to have that great experience of, of going to court. I learned at the end of the day, and that's why I say it's perceived ownership, because we fought over two words. And those two words could be interpreted by a judge, a jury, a patent examiner. Right. So three years comes down to two words, interpretation of two words. That's what I went, okay, okay, okay. I don't like what's being played here. So, because I don't think you own anything then, because those words can be interpreted differently. But that being said, you, you always want to go into a fight ready. 
right? So yep. even though those are some of the, the things you don't really want to hear, you still file all those things. And you're right, maybe it's your trademark that protects you. Maybe it's your URL that protects you. Maybe it's your design patent that protects you. Or maybe it's just all these other stuff that people look at and go, you know, I'll stay away from that guy. See, that's why, that's why the 20 patents are there. Right, they're all big, no trespassing signs. And you hope they work. And the other thing too, people ask, well, how, do you, how did you afford 20 patents? When I licensed it to a company, they paid for the patents. Right. All right. So, and it was a big enough idea that the revenue was coming in. It, it warranted to do that. Right. Yeah. It wasn't like you filed them all at once. That's over 20 years. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Gotta get, you got to have a reality here a little bit. Because when people hear that, they just go like, look. But, but for simple ideas, it, it doesn't require a wall of patents. No, it does not. Excellent stuff. Well, I definitely will continue to recommend your book and your class. And um, just thank you for the work you're doing with all the inventors groups now. With uh, what? Tell me, tell me, give me a quick blurb on the what is it? IAG. Yeah, let me. You know, I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, I do believe we need stronger patents, and I believe that inventors need to be represented on Capitol Hill and the USPTO. So I, I put together a new group, and you're part of that group too, thank you very much. Uh, a good people coming together that uh, we can show the USPTO and Capitol Hill that we have kind of united now. Yeah. And it's growing and there's some really exciting stuff. Uh, we have over 30 presidents of inventor group leaders across the country have joined us. Um, there's a lot of service providers such as yourself that's joining us. I'm going to build the biggest army on the planet of good people. So people can see, look, these are people I can work with. These are right. great people. And that's what's important. And I, it's missing. Kevin, no one's doing yeah. it. And yeah. um, it's, it's been done piecemeal, but never in a one big, you know, one yeah. big uh, unified way. So I, mm -hmm. I, my hat's off to you for doing that. And yeah, I think I'll, it's. I'll, I'll, be a, I'll be a part of this however I can. Yeah, no, thank you for stepping up so quickly and doing that. Um, I do believe we're stronger together. Right, and we all have a common goal, and that's that's what it's all about. So, as inventors and people that are helping inventors, we need to we need to get to come together here and and have a voice and be heard. Right. Yeah, good, excellent. All right. Well, again, I thank you for the time, Stephen. And no, wait. I got one quick quick question for you now. Sure. Because I've been watching some of the stuff you're doing, and your success rate is pretty darn high to get those patents and design patents. I saw that. You, you did a great campaign. How are you doing that? Well, so one thing, like I said, I like design patents. Uh, there's a lot of bang for the buck, and uh, they've gotten stronger. Okay. And, uh, and so, but here's the key thing. 95% of the time, they're approved. So if, if you okay. put my approval rate against any other patent attorneys, I'm I'm way ahead of them. That's because of the design patents. Now I only market for design patents. Okay. Okay. The utility patents that I get are kind of by the way. It's like after we start talking with them, I realized well you can't have a design patent or you don't really need a design patent for that. Like a chemical composition, you're not going to get a, a okay. design patent. So the utility patents I do are really from former clients or or people who thought they wanted a design patent and they actually don't. Got it. Okay. And so I just love, you know, it's really smart. I love what you're doing there because you're showing success, right? That you know what you're doing. Um, why don't other people do that? I, I've never seen anybody do that the way you've done it recently. And it's, it's, you want to work with people that, that are showing results. Right. Well, it's funny. I've been doing interviews like this with clients who have been successful. So, just last week, we finished up with Judy Edwards, who you know from Squatty Potty. Um, we did all of her design patents, uh, you know, back in the day, and and you know, what an incredible success story that is. So that's those are the types of uh, clients that I'm going to get on this interview system and really try to mm -hmm. kind of get some, you know, just the, the little tidbits of information that they've learned, and even people who have not been successful. I think I think you can learn a lot from failures. 
Not that well, you don't say to... that. Don't say that. But you're right. You're... <laughs> <laughs> That's how I've learned all of us. <laughs> well, I didn't get these gray hairs from for nothing here. Uh, well, congratulations. You know, um, Judy Judy Edwards is wonderful. Her product is spectacular. Uh, I didn't know that you had done that work for her. Yeah. Good stuff, because she's a star on Shark Tank. Yep. She went to the moon and back. Um, congratulations. Yep. That's a huge deal. Yeah, well, that was a fun story. Uh, I've got a number of other clients uh, kind of, you know, uh, and I've had a fair number of clients on Shark Tank that didn't do a deal uh, for various reasons. But uh, everyone, you know, I think Shark Tank has actually helped uh, this whole industry and people going, yeah, you know, maybe I should dust off that idea I had in, you know, the 18 uh, or 1980s and do something with it finally. Well, you know, I, I wrote this article, The Three Lies You Hear on Shark Tank, and <laughs> and I got some emails from some of the uh, the judges, and I know some of these guys, and they said, Steve, come on, don't pull back the curtain so fast on us on this one. <laughs> um, I tell everybody, look, whatever you have to do to, to increase your chances of success, if, is it Shark Tank, crowdfunding, licensing, right. or I just do them all? Right. There you go. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do them all. Good stuff. All right. Well, Steve, thanks a lot. We'll be in touch again soon, I'm sure. And uh, just keep up the good fight. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin.